A Patriot's History of the United States Chapter 2, Part 1 Colonial Adolescence, 1707-1763 The Inability to Remain European England's American colonies represented only a small part of the British Empire by the late 1700s but their vast potential for land and agricultural wealth seemed limitless. Threats still remained, especially from the French in Canada and Indians on the frontier, but few colonists saw England herself as posing any real threat at the beginning of the century. Repeatedly, English colonists stated their allegiance to the crown and their affirmation of their own rights as English subjects. Even when conflicts arose between colonists and their colonial governors, Americans appealed to the king to enforce those rights against their colonial administrators, not depose them. Between 1707, when England, Scotland, and Wales formed the United Kingdom, and 1763, however, changes occurred within the empire itself that forced an overhaul of imperial regulations. The new policies convinced the 13 American colonies that England did not see them as citizens, but as subjects, in the worst sense of the word. By attempting to foster dependence among English colonists throughout the world on each other and ultimately on the mother country, England only managed to pit American against other parts of the empire. At the same time, despite their desperate backgrounds and histories, the American colonies started to share a common set of understanding about liberty and their position in the empire. On every side, then, the colonies that eventually made up the United States began to develop internal unity and an independent attitude. Timeline. 1707, England, Wales, Scotland unite into the United Kingdom, or Great Britain. 1702 to 1713, Queen Anne's War. 1714 to 1727, George I's reign, 1727 to 1760, George II's reign, 1733, Georgia founded, 1734 to 1741, the First Great Awakening, 1735, John Peter Zinger trial, 1744 to 1748, King George's War, 1754, the Albany Congress, 1754 to 63, French and Indian War, 1760, George III accedes to the throne, 1763, the Proclamation of 1763. Shaping Americanness. In Democracy in America, the brilliant French observer Alexis de Tocqueville predicted that a highly refined culture was unlikely to evolve in America, largely because of its lowly colonial origins. The intermingling of classes and constant rising and sinking of individuals in an egalitarian society, Tocqueville wrote, had a detrimental effect on the arts, painting, literature, music, theater, and education. In place of high or refined mores, Tocqueville continued, Americans had built a democratic culture that was highly accessible, but ultimately lacking in the brilliance that characterized European art forms. Certainly, some colonial Americans tried to emulate Europe, particularly when it came to creating institutions of higher learning. Harvard College, founded in 1636, was followed by William & Mary in 1693, Yale in 1701, Princeton 1746, the College of Philadelphia, University of Pennsylvania 1740, and between 1764 and 1769, King's College, Columbia, Brown, Queen's College, Rutgers, and Dartmouth. Yet from the beginning, these schools differed sharply from the European progenitors in that they were founded by a variety of Protestant sects not a state church, and though tied to religious denominations, they were nevertheless relatively secular. Harvard, for example, was founded to train clergy 
and yet by the end of the colonial era, only a quarter of its graduates became ministers. The rest pursued careers in business, law, medicine, politics, and teaching. A few schools, such as the College of New Jersey, later Princeton, led by the Reverend John Witherspoon, bucked the trend. Witherspoon transformed Princeton into a campus much more oriented toward religious and moral philosophy, all the while charging it with a powerful revolutionary fervor. Witherspoon's Princeton was swimming against the tide, however. Not only were most curricula becoming more secular, but they were also more down to earth and applied. Colonial colleges slighted the dead languages Latin and Greek by introducing French and German. Modern historical studies complemented and sometimes replaced ancient history. The proliferation of colleges, nine in America, meant access for more middle-class youths, such as John Adams, a Massachusetts farm boy who studied at Harvard. To complete this democratization process, appointed boards of trustees, not the faculty or church, governed American universities. Early American science also reflected the struggles faced by those who sought a more pragmatic knowledge. For example, John Winthrop Jr., the son of the Massachusetts founder, struggled in vain to conduct pure research and bring his scientific career to the intention of the European intellectual community. As the first American member of the Royal Society of London, Winthrop wrote countless letters abroad and even sent specimens of rattlesnakes and other indigenous American flora and fauna, which received barely a passing glance from European scientists. More successful was Benjamin Franklin, the American scientist who applied his research in meteorology and electricity to invent the lightning rod, as well as bifocals and the Franklin stove. Americans wanted the kind of science that would heat their homes and improve their eyesight, not explain the origins of life in the universe. Colonial art, architecture, drama, and music also reflected American practicality, and democracy spawned in a frontier environment. Artists found their only market for paintings in portraiture and later portrait art. Talented painters like John Singleton Copley and Benjamin West made their living painting the likeness of colonial merchants, planters, and their families. Eventually, both sailed for Europe to pursue pure artistic endeavors. American architecture never soared to magnificence, though a few public buildings, colleges, churches, and private homes reflected an aesthetic influenced by classical motifs and Georgian styles. Drama, too, struggled. Puritan, Massachusetts prohibited theater shows, the devil's workshops, whereas thespians in Philadelphia, Williamsburg, and Charleston performed amateurish productions of Shakespeare and contemporary English drama. Not until Royal Tyler tapped the Patriot theme and the comic potential of the Yankee archetype in his 1789 production of The Contrast would American playwrights finally discover their niche, somewhere between high and low art. In 18th century Charleston, Boston, and Philadelphia, the upper classes could occasionally hear Handel and Mozart performed by professional orchestras. Most musical endeavor, however, was applied to religion, where church hymns were sung a cappella and occasionally to the accompaniment of a church organ. Americans customized and syncopated hymns, greatly aggravating pious English churchmen. Reflecting the most predominant musical influence in colonial America, the folk idiom of Anglo, Celtic, and African immigrants, American music already had coalesced into a base upon which new genres of church and secular music, gospel, field songs, and white folk ballads would ultimately emerge. Colonial literature likewise focused on religion or otherwise addressed the needs of common folk. This pattern was set with Bradford's of Plymouth Plantation, which related the exciting story of the pilgrim with an eye to the all-powerful role of God in shaping their destiny. And Bradstreet, an accomplished 17th century colonial poet who continued to be popular after her death, also conveyed religious themes and emphasized divine inspiration of human events. Although literacy was widespread, 
Americans read mainly the Bible, political tracts, and how-to books on farming, mechanics, and moral improvement. Not Greek philosophers or the campaigns of Caesar. Benjamin Franklin's autobiography is a classic example of the American penchant for pragmatic literature that continues to this day. Franklin wrote his autobiography during the pre-revolutionary era, though it was not published until the 19th century. Several generations of American schoolchildren grew up on these tales of his youthful adventures and early career, culminating with his gaining fame as a Pennsylvania printer, writer, scientist, diplomat, and patriot politician. Franklin's 13 virtues, honesty, thrift, devotion, faithfulness, trust, courtesy, cleanliness, temperance, work, humility, and so on, constituted a list of personal traits aspired to by virtually every Puritan, Quaker, or Catholic in the colonies. Franklin's saga thereby became the first major work in a literary genre that would define Americanism. The rags to riches story and the self-improvement guide rolled into one. Franklin's other great contribution to American folk literature, Poor Richard's Almanac, provided an affordable complement to the autobiography. Poor Richard was a simply written magazine featuring weather forecasts, crop advice, predictions, and premonitions, witticisms, and folksy advice on how to succeed and live virtuously. Hey, we'll continue with Chapter 2 in the next video. Thanks so much for watching. If you get any value out of these, please click like, subscribe to the channel, and leave a comment down below. Love to hear from you. Love you guys, as Tigger says, ta-ta for now.